September 1969, and and I was a to become an instructor at Morehouse. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had met Julian. I think Ju I met Julian in '64. He was one of the first people I met. Uh, my mother, you know, who was a journalist, and had covered a lot of the civil rights stuff, and had gone to Montgomery in '56 to cover the bus boycott from Los Angeles, and had met Dr. King, and had met uh, Reverend Abernathy. Mother said, you know, the, you have to meet Julian Bond because he writes the most literate uh, news releases in the civil rights movement. <laughs> <laughs> to, this day. You know, to this day, and so the, you know, and so uh, I think I actually walked down from Morehouse, uh, past Hunter Street to Raymond, where the where the SNCC offices were, and then you would see just because his dad was still alive and you know horseman bond and teaching it at my university, his mom, who I got to know very well because she was working at the library, yeah, I'd see him and got to know him pretty well. So, but in '69 got invited to some of the parties at the house on Sunset. Mm. And I think that was sort of like where I first encountered uh, some of the people who, you know, were still, I think, pretty traumatized from 68 and trying to get their lives back in order. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, the civil rights movement has sort of scattered and 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 a little bit, I, I don't want to say leaderless, but, you know, this, I, I contend that that was a, a psychological trauma that that lasted for for decades for so many of the people, and um, at first I, I think I encountered your dad, and mom, in the basement of Julian's house mm -hmm. on on Sunset. But the first time I really remember having a conversation, and particularly with your mom, was in, at, on Canolia at Howard and Jane's house there. And I remember them being invited. We, Pearl and I got invited over for dinner. I think it was a very small group, and and it, it actually it was. Howard and Jane, mm -hmm. and your dad and mom, and that was where I think for me the kind of connection, you know, I'm a I was a Congregationalist. Mm -hmm. I mean, the sort of you know there was it was beyond the. So you were a Congregationalist in LA. Uh, honey, were, okay. my parent in South Carolina in the 1860s. I mean, the, the Congregationalist Church mm -hmm. uh, created a school. My family was Catholic and Episcopalian there. But then they created uh, a um, a a school, mm -hmm. Avery Institute, mm -hmm. that my great grandparents mm -hmm. and my grand paternal grandmother attended, and then she went to, and then they sent people to Fisk. My grandmother went to Fisk, mm -hmm. so so we converted, and then you know we were congregationalists in Chicago, in South Carolina, Chicago, and then my other grandmother went to Emerson Institute in Mobile, which was also American Missionary Association. Both my grandparents mm -hmm. went there. So uh, we became Congregationalists through education, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and then I grew up in the Church of Christian Fellowship mm -hmm. in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. which had been How Harold Kingsley and then what was Reverend Hargett. Mm -hmm. So it was a very progressive, um, you know, it was just a typical congregational, social justice, progressive. Mm -hmm. And my, although my mother and father, my mother was, you know, an avowed atheist and, uh, you know, just, uh, just a, you know, a hell raiser from way, but, but believed deeply in the ethical mm -hmm. train. So, you know, that, that was when I connected. I remember having a long talk with your mom sitting on the floor, mm -hmm. you know, about uh, Lincoln, was it? The mm -hmm. What was the school in Marion, mm -hmm. and you know that's been a, a, a sort of a link with a lot of people. But so I, you know, I, I got to know them mm -hmm. a little bit, and then your dad ran for the the Congress in the first time. Mm -hmm. It was what seventy, mm -hmm. and um, so I was still teaching at Morehouse. Didn't really get as involved, but Shirley did, mm -hmm. and Shirley and I had been friends since I, my girlfriend in college had grown up with Shirley mm -hmm. in uh, Philadelphia. I mean, you know, yeah. <laughs> and so I knew Shirley and, and, and then got to know David. And then that's how in 73 I got, I got brought in to do speech writing for Maynard. Mm -hmm. And then Pearl and I did. And then that's when, that's when the relationships moved from just being 
hi, how are you doing, nice people, friendly, to the political stuff. And, mm -hmm. and you know, so I wound up, Pearl was working at WXIA on Ebony Beat Journal, the first black television show over there. And so she couldn't be up front writing for Maynard. Mm -hmm. So, but I would, had just finished writing my dissertation at Emory and I could, it had the summer off, that summer of 73. So I went down there every day and I, I would, my job was to translate Stu Eisenstadt into English. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Stu would do the, do the policy stuff and then I would put it into the 10 point program. And then we also then started doing some of the speeches that Maynard did and, and, and developed, you know, a, a good reputation internally in the campaign. And that's when I got to meet, you know, not so much Andy's as, as Stoney mm -hmm. and, you know, the people who, there was, there was such a fluidity back and forth between the two, you know, between the Andy Young people mm -hmm. and the Maynard people. Because mm -hmm. uh, it was still, I mean, at, at that point it was still, this is the next, this is the next generation of the movement. It is, you know, bringing to life citizenship and service and, you know, something very different from what I think it evolved into, you know, now, I mean, you know, it's an African-American political class that is not necessarily directly linked to the social justice movement that put them there. Mm -hmm. And the civil rights movement that put them there. So, mm -hmm. so I, I mean, uh, although I'm younger than your dad, and and was you know an obvious, and was also younger than I'm um, 65, younger than uh, than than Maynard. I think I was more, much more deeply influenced in my, uh, at least by the civil rights movement. Al mm -hmm. Although unlike Andy and uh, John mm -hmm. and Julian, all of whom you know became very close friends. Uh, uh, even though they became close friends, you know, I didn't have that. I mean, we came south in the early 60s. We encountered segregation. Uh, we had our share of, you know, traumatic experiences in Alabama where, where we lived. We lived in, we lived in Tuskegee. And, and my mother made many trips south. I mean, she even went to Albany. I mean, she, she was all over the place. Uh, I didn't make all those trips. I said, "Mother, you're just crazy. I can't go on all these trips. I got to get an education." But, uh, but, and then when I got dropped at Morehouse in '64, they were living again in Tuskegee, and uh, and I didn't, you know, there were, I, the, 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 you know, so I I saw the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. met, had met Dr. King in the late '50s when he came out to Los Angeles after Mother had been to the, came over to the house, you know, mm. had ice cream and cake. <laughs> You know, picked him up at the Hotel Watkins on Adams Boulevard, down from where my grandfather lived, and brought him over. Um, so, but, and and then j just one other kind of preamble, you know, if you were in college as I was from 1964 to 68, mm -hmm. uh, you were powerfully influenced still by, I mean, this was Selma. Mm -hmm. I could I could have gone to Selma in 65, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and I called home and said, but should I go? And my mother said, no, I don't think that's safe. <laughs> Yeah, you know, because you know, they were coming to get students. Right. You know, they, that was they would come and get students. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. King came over and got students to march when they wouldn't see Julian. Mm -hmm. You know, and we marched around. Uh, so you know, you you, but it was. So you were part of that. Oh yeah. But I consider that I think anything you did in Atlanta yeah. was was sort of civil rights light, <laughs> <laughs> because you were. You know, they would pull, it was so, you know, they would, because Herbert Jenkins was the police chief, they would pull you out of line, they would take your photograph, they'd get your name. It was, it was all kind of orchestrated, but I don't Movie think you, well, I just don't think you were ever really at risk of, th this was a community that wasn't, you, you know, this wasn't Emmett Till country. This mm -hmm. isn't, you know, although, I mean, those were things that I remember as a child and being mm -hmm. terrified by. Mm -hmm. The one thing that, that I think really did change all of that was, you know, April of 68, the, my senior year, mm -hmm. you know, and the assassination because, you know, uh, you know, Dr. King lay in state at Spelman. Mm -hmm. uh, all the students were engaged in that. I mean, my job, I went down and volunteered 
in the basement of the West Tennessee Street Baptist Church because uh, I knew Reverend Abernathy and that's where I met uh, Earl Graves mm -hmm. who managed the funeral for Bobby Kennedy hmm. and Earl Graves and Jay Cooper were the ones he sent down mm -hmm. and you know irony of irony he's mm -hmm. dead mm -hmm. within months after that but mm -hmm. You know, my job was to go to, to work out of the gym, the, up, the upstairs of the gym, and escort uh, prominent dignitaries over to Spelman to pay their respects. And of course, it was an open casket. Mm -hmm. I took, you know, Ruby D mm -hmm. and Aussie Davis was the first time I met them. Um, but you know, th so that then you're just then you're in, then you're encountering, mm -hmm. you know, in a very painful way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the death of a martyr. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I had experiences, but it really wasn't, I didn't really come into my own, I don't think, until, you know, I, politics. I, I worked for Maynard for four and a half years. And, you know, I, I think if I were to, to say something about my own political style, it was somewhere between your dad's and Maynard's. It wasn't, it was definitely not the confrontational. Mm -hmm. It tended to be more uh, diplomatic and try to find a solution that didn't sort of divide. Maynard was a you know Maynard was an advocate for the position, you know, and um, and so I I ran for the Fulton County Commission and had very strong support. I think first of all nobody thought I could win because it was countywide. That was crazy, mm -hmm. but I had very strong support from. I mean, Daddy King endorsed me, and you know William Holmes Borders. Uh, but but also very strong support. Clearly, Maynard, Andy, and people like that. I mean, that was what there was. A, there there was never a machine, mm -hmm. but there was clearly the African American community and the progressive white community were looking there for guidance and direction. And and you know, and they viewed that winning and getting a, you know ultimately a majority on the Fulton County Commission would really consolidate a lot of what needed to happen in behalf of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to underscore that. It right. was never about right. Fulton County. It was in behalf of Atlanta, you know. Right. Right. And, uh, and my, you know, my great apostasy there mm -hmm. was that I thought that, uh, and, it, and it came after a couple of years of serving on the Fulton County Commission and watching all the growth go to Cobb and to Gwinnett mm -hmm. and then you saw all this huge amount of real estate north of the city mm -hmm. that was in the Fulton County tax base which wasn't getting any of that money mm -hmm. and so my position was uh, and this was my great apostasy which was to uh, support the extension of Georgia 400 mm -hmm. you know and I mean you know I was mm -hmm. I was you know for the in-town neighborhood groups the Ruth Walls I mean I was like you know Lomax we'll never support him John Meyer, mm -hmm. we'll never speak to him again. Mm -hmm. You know, Rachel, <laughs> Rachel, Rachel's best friend is John's little boy, you know. Well, not little boys in college now, but, uh, you know, uh, never speak to him again. He's horrible. He's, you know, this is the death knell for Atlanta. And my view was, this is, this is opening up a new lifeline for Atlanta. And, and uh, you know, I, some of my friendships barely survived. I remember when Maine, when Andy, uh, issued a building permit for the Atlanta Financial Center mm -hmm. in the middle mm -hmm. of the right-of-way that we were acquiring mm -hmm. and I sued mm -hmm. and shortly I have the letter <laughs> fit to be tied she said yeah this isn't free you know this, I mean, what kind of free? I mean, <laughs> it was just you know, outrage but you know my position was at the end of the day uh, I think I think this is really not going to be at all harmful. <laughs> I think this is going to be really quite good for Atlanta. And I, and I, you know, one of the great ironies of every time I see your dad is, you know, he's always saying, "People ought to name that road after you," you know, because because uh, it really didn't harm the city, and the city flourished as a. But you know, that it was. I think. But how did How did you see that? I mean, because you know, I I remember you know the this notion that this would be the death of Buckhead. Yeah. Everybody would just leave Buckhead. Now mm -hmm. Buckhead is like the most expensive real estate yeah. in Georgia. Yeah. Right? And, and right, and to be frank, to be frank with you, not only is, it, is Buckhead the most expensive, you really can't tell the difference between parts of North Atlanta and Sandy Spring. I mean, they're, it's, it, they're now urbanized. Mm -hmm. 
and the suburbanization, the rural areas north of the rivers, the river are now highly suburbanized and small municipalities. But you know, I, I would say first of all that one of the things that you just cannot dismiss in any of this conversation is race. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I look at how far Atlanta has come. I came here in 1964, in the nearly 50 years I have been here. I mean, you went from African Americans being really almost, I don't want to say ghettoized, but I mean, there were, they, we, we were, it was almost like, there, I mean, literally, the, you know, the, the Berlin Wall. I mean, there were real boundaries on where you could go. I remember once as a student, uh, a group of us, including Andre Fry. Remember Andre Fry, the theater person, uh, just a, we went and decided to go up Cascade Road, and where Cascade United Methodist Church is, and have a picnic mm -hmm. by the Cascade. You know, I thought they were. Gonna, I thought if we were going to get lynched, that's where we were going to get lynched. You know, the people just, what are you doing in this area? We're not supposed to be here. Uh, the African American community was very restricted in where it could go. And there was a kind of kabuki about how you interacted racially in this community. People understood it because they've been doing it for decades. But that kabuki got utterly disrupted when Maynard got elected. I mean, just some of the vitriol that was articulated by people who, you know, I mean, I, you know, Sanders became a friend of mine, you know, mm -hmm. but, you know, he talked about the, you know, well, first of all, Macelle, the death of the city, and Sanders, you know, anytime uh, a black person did something bad downtown, it was like, you know, the whole community had to own it, you know, it was a black person doing something wrong downtown, you know, but there, there was this real sense that the city's economic, cultural, social, vitality was about to be uh, destroyed by the political emergence of the African-American community. And, uh, and there was panic. I mean, white people ran from the city. And, you know, I remember we bought our first home in Southwest Atlanta in 1972, 73, 73 or 74, something like right there. You know, you buy these little, nice little houses and people, I mean, that all white neighborhood, all black within, you know, months. So I, I think, first of all, there was this fear that if you pass some of these boundaries, um, and, and this was reinforced, I think, in a, in a, maybe this is, I'm sort of thinking out loud, unintentionally by some of the in-town neighborhoods, is that, you know, whites will leave. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there were two things that happened. One, you know, for me, being on the Fulton County Commission, after a while, I stopped identifying myself as Atlanta. I started, you know, I started ultimately identifying myself as Fulton County. And you saw all of this uh, extraordinary real estate that had the potential to become connected to the city, first through a road and ultimately through transit, mm -hmm. and that it was important. That that be a that that be two way because there would be jobs out there that weren't going to be inside the city, mm -hmm. and there would be residential out there. The you know, Atlanta could, although a big city geographically, couldn't accommodate all the growth that was going to occur, and growth was going to occur, and it was happening all around. So my view was, uh, and, I, and this really just came, Andrea. I, you know, I was English. I was an English teacher. Mm -hmm. This came from zoning. I mean, you actually would see it. You were touching, feeling. And, and feeling it, and what you saw was this bottleneck that was emerging right north of the city that people couldn't get in or couldn't get out. And I thought that it just made sense to connect. I thought it was there was risk associated with it because it might have led to white flight and it might have led to, you know, a, a worse congestion, although you know, I don't think you could blame Georgia 400 for any more congestion than you get from 85 or 75 or all the, you know, this is a road happy metropolitan area. But, it, but it just, it just, it just, for me, this was, this was, this was just, it seemed like the right thing to do. And, you know, 
Maynard looked at me like you, you, know, you sold us down the river, and you know, David Rock and all these people who, you know. But and and I think it was, but it was so. It was two things. One was, you know, that it was apostasy to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but there really was almost nobody on the commission. You had Reggie Eves on the commission. I mean, we, we all were seeing what was happening. <laughs> the question was, how do you connect with it? Uh, Chuck Williams. I mean, we were all people who had deep links. We all lived in the city. You know, we all lived in Southwest Atlanta. Um, but I think there was a there was a compelling economic reality, which I think the myopia of most of the people in the city didn't see. So the idea was that Dunwoody was developing around 85 and 285. Well, it was Dunwoody on one side, and then it was Cobb on the other. I mean, so you had all, so Galleria and all that mm -hmm. on one side. Mm -hmm. On this, and we had residential, but we weren't getting the office, the institutional, and the commercial. We weren't getting the real tax growth. Mm -hmm. And um, and it wasn't until we linked, we opened up the bottleneck mm -hmm. into the city that then you saw then you saw, and I think both the city and the county were pretty darn good about it. The cor the growth was along the 400 corridor. I mean, you so and you know we we made you know there there was the sufficient right of way in there to take MARTA up. And you remember how hard, you know, mm -hmm. we don't want MARTA. Mm -hmm. We don't want those people coming into our neighborhoods. Well, now those people can come into those their neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. You saw developing around uh, the hospital a huge employment for, that was, you know, and you go out there now, I mean, who's employed there? That's and, Fulton County? Yes. Yeah, I mean, that that is the Georgia Orange Quarter. You've got, you've got Northside, you've got mm -hmm. A Scottish right you've got so it's you know it is both a place where the service is delivered but where a lot of people are employed and they are very diverse and I think the other part of it is that um, that a lot of the diversity of Fulton County is driven by black folks now I mean you know where do the real housewives of Atlanta live they don't live in Fulton in Atlanta they live in up there in you know, one of those. Alpharetta Mansion. Yeah, um, Alpharetta Ma Mac Mac Mansions. So I mean, I think that 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 for me, you know, I think there's there's always there are these. I think there are these disparities, and there are certain things that are unfair about the taxation and the city paying more. But the city's vitality is both a measure of what's in the city and what surrounds the city, and. You know, I think it's hard to argue today that um, Atlanta has been adversely impacted by the economic development of the rest of the region. It's, it's a highly competitive, but it's a metropolitan economy. And uh, so I think it was the, I, I think it was the right thing to do. And I think, you know, that that once Andy got, I mean, Maynard was pissed, but so once... how did you get, how did you get him on board? Well, first of all, you know, I think your father's a relationships person, you know I mean? So it's, it wasn't always, um, uh, you know, I have a, I have a firm ideological position and I'm not moving off of it. And I went over to him and I said, mm -hmm. look, you know, uh, I want you to see the world from my perspective. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of things that you're going to ask Fulton County to do and you're going to say, view this from the perspective of the city. Mm -hmm. I want you to see what I think is happening here and that it's an important ultimately for the city. And I remember when we, and so I said, I want you first of all just to go with me. Let's go look at it. Mm -hmm. Because when I went on the board of commissioners, you know, if you went north of the river, you were going to encounter more cows and horses than you were people. Mm -hmm. But very quickly, you know, the Herman Miller plant which ultimately got bought by um, the people who own Kleenex. I can't remember who it is, but by Kimberly, Clark. Kimberly Clark. You know, Kimberly and, and Kimberly Clark, and I mean, there was stuff going on in, up there. And I remember when we went up to the Herman Miller plant. Uh, you know, it's this beautiful uh, facility designed by Max Goggin and Merrill Elam, who had been with Heary and Company. 
and now have their hip little design firm across from the church. Mm-hmm. That's, that's Max and Merrill. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I said, I want you to go up here. I said, first of all, this is beautifully done. And I want you to just see, you know, clean uh, industry up in North Fulton. And, and who do we meet? The person that came from that, that her Miller sense is this really elegant black woman. From, you know, to, and she says, you know, these are great jobs up here. And, you know, we, so, I mean, I, I think that, that your, you know, the, your dad, who is this kind of, in addition to his theological and, and social justice, he is, you know, he's, he's, He's incorporated within that a sense that you know growing economies and how do you grow an economy and how do you bring uh, um, economic development. I mean, so he's you know that's been I don't need to tell you that's been a big part of his of the way he has envisioned uh, transformation and social justice and you know so I think that as he began to see that evolution, I think he was more open to the possibilities of what it would mean for um, for the city. And then, you know, it, after a while, I mean, you know, you're still, a, Fulton County was the most, um, I'd say, cosmopolitan of the regional counties. Mm-hmm. It was certainly the most uh, politically diverse. Uh, so I got elected in 78. I mean, it began to open up mm-hmm. uh, to uh, whites voting for black folks. Mm-hmm. And um, then, I, you know, to some extent, DeCab, but DeCab really only because of Manuel mm-hmm. Maloof. I mean, you know, I don't think as much consistently in the early days because of everybody else. So it was pretty hard, after, really, for a for the city to isolate itself from its from its other political partners, mm-hmm. because you were still fighting the battle with um, you know both very conservative and largely white uh, power and economic interests in Cobb and in Gwinnett, mm-hmm. and they were still saying you know we don't want Marta, we don't want to pay our share of the bills. And, you know, one of the things that I was doing as chairman of the board was, you know, I was passing the local option sales tax, you know, partnering with the city so mm-hmm. the city gets more revenue, mm-hmm. splitting the uh, splitting the revenue. So, I mean, it was, after a while, it was uh, pretty hard for uh, the allies to not to, even even if we weren't as, comfortable in some sense as we had been. I think I'll just make one other point. You know, uh, when I went into politics, I got elected in 1978. I had just turned 31. Hmm. You know, I was a kid. I went to work for Maynard five and a half years, almost six years before that. I was 25 when I'm, you know, going. Some of this was also my growing up and becoming a little bit more independent and, and, and doing some things which were both appropriate but also stupid. I mean, running against Maynard in 89 was dumb, you know. On the other hand, what I will say is that uh, I definitely established my independence. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that if I had a critique of the and this is probably, you know, I don't know whether this is, I should even say that, but since I, I, I think this, I was, if I have a critique of the African American political class, it is that it has been too comfortable, uh, you know, sort of looking out for its interests and not really having a lot of divergent points of view in it. You know, it's become an establishment, you know. And, uh, and you know, obviously it was to my detriment because uh, I could not ever, I couldn't get elected to anything inside the city of Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't, I, they couldn't, Maynard tried, <laughs> Maynard tried, Maynard was vengeful, you know, Maynard tried to get me uh, in 90 uh, from being reelected to the county commission. And it told me, he said, if, I, if you run against me, I will destroy you, Michael. Mm-hmm. I mean, he said that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I said, well, you yeah. know. 
Um, and he couldn't do that, but he could stop me, and he did, from getting elected mayor. And you know, and you know, maybe, and you know, I should thank everybody for that. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, to do, you know, life is, but you know, but yeah, well, but but what I would say is that, um, you know, I think that, you know, one of the differences. I mean, if I step back and say, you know, what's the same? What's the same about the African American political leadership? that has emerged in this city really since the late 60s. Mm -hmm. Highly educated, mm -hmm. cosmopolitan, uh, you know, varying degrees but nonetheless still very much informed by the ethic of the civil rights movement. So there's a big social justice element associated with it. But all, but also a, a, a middle class aspiration for for economic success and entrepreneurial quality to it. And in that sense, there's really not very much difference between you know Andy Maynard Shirley me. John Bill. I mean that we all kind of you know we all college educated, most of us advanced degrees, most of us had been out elsewhere in the world. Uh, we weren't, you know, wide-eyed yahoos walking into something that we didn't know where we were going. Um, and also a, a sense that what you're creating here ultimately has huge economic and social impact. I, I don't think you know, I, I think that the folks inside the city, and 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 probably Kasim even, I would say Kasim is the next generation. But if you look at Kasim, you know, coming out of the legislature, I mean, his bread and butter is relationships with all of the other metro. Mm -hmm. So I think just as the you know, Maynard was pushing the envelope on power and control in the city, I was pushing it on a more regional level. And then Andy, of course, what he brought was the global. Uh, and, you know, I would argue that whatever our differences were, um, the one thing that's very clear is that the notion that the city was going to die because of electing African Americans into leadership. You know, that that certainly hasn't been the case. And that the kind of Maynard both played into, I think, just because he his he was an, he was as a lawyer, the kind of you know, the kind of lawyer he was. He was either an advocate or an adversary. He was not a negotiating lawyer. He was the one who was gonna take the strong position one for or against. He was a litigator. And in some ways I, I think that, that litigation mentality was sort of the theme of his uh, I, I said if, it, if, his, if his administration had a personality certainly the first two I think he was he was more mellow by the time he came back mm -hmm. but he'd been doing all that bond work maybe that mellowed mm -hmm. him out you know that Andy brought a b both a global perspective but he also brought a diplomatic approach to the work that you know his whole way of doing the work was around finding common ground and uh, dialing down the intensities and hostilities. Um, and that, you know, if you, this is, I mean, I've been here 50 years. I remember when, you know, you went beyond cast, you got, I remember getting on 285 and they hadn't finished building it, you yeah. know. And you were you were you were drag racing on 285. I remember when you would drive out to the old Hartsfield, and you knew that you had to be careful because that was they would give black people tickets if you went out there. I mean, what this city has emerged into, and you know, with the Olympics being in some ways 
the expression of it, although I think the city has gone so far beyond what the Olympics did, but I mean, it, where suddenly there was a recognition that this tradition that we have of accommodating change and diversity actually is not just something, is, is a strength that you can market. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that it will do what Atlanta always wants you to do, which is to make money off of something. You know, that it, it's economically. So, so is that the, is that the, the because I, I was playing around with this idea that in some ways Atlanta is kind of where the New South white people interacted with the social justice black people to actually, mm -hmm. cre to actually create a common, well, I don't know if it's a common vision, but it's a, it's a functioning vision. But what what about the white folks in during this journey? I mean, how? Yeah. I mean, I I I, I had forgotten that Stu Eisenstadt did issues for my dad's campaign. Yeah. Then um, you, and you should interview. Yeah. You, you have to interview Stu. And then of course Jimmy Carter. Yeah. Um, but Stu, I think, and and I saw I saw him on an, you know we see one another. He's in D.C. and and, mm -hmm. and I see he was on an airplane coming down here. I would really talk to him because Stu is so thoughtful. But, um, you know, I think just as you would have a hard time, you have to be careful not to stereotype the black community. I think you have to be careful with the white. I, I would say there were some po different pockets in the white community. So, on the one hand, you have to remember there was always a small but highly influential Jewish community that. Uh, tended to be low-key, very successful financially. They were the merchants, the riches. Mm -hmm. But they were also cosmopolitan and they were related to the Jewish community all around the country. You know, so uh, there was a, that, that one piece of whatever happened with black folks mm -hmm. and our achieving our political and social aspirations, there was a progressive element in the Jewish community that was that was a part of that. That would be one thing I would say. There, when you think about the not you know the the, the Gentile community. Um, I, I would say that the affluent Gentile community uh, almost bought hook, line, and sinker that Maynard was bad news. And, you know, it wasn't just Sam Massell, but, and I don't think of Sam as really articulating the point of view of the Jewish community, but really the kind of the, what has become the buckhead. But I mean, it was preserve and protect and keep them restrained. I think you have to go back and read some of the stuff that Carl Sanders said during that period, mm -hmm. you know, because Carl was very tough on these issues. Um, that there was a degrading of the city that was occurring. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that uh, the black radicals and the criminal element were almost one and the same. The Atlanta Journal Constitution particularly under Reg Murphy, was, uh, I mean, I, they should be embarrassed by some of the stuff that you go back and read some of the stuff that they wrote and the racialism of it. Mm. Um, what Maynard tapped into early on uh, in the, was that there were, was this neighborhood movement that was in its infancy. And he really I think that was his, I think so that was his. Your dad actually won, you know, people forget that he really ran for the bigger office sooner. Mm -hmm. He won earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, think, I think he benefited, and this is, I'm going to say this with, I hope, without seeming, a, you know, that this is patronizing, but I think he benefited from having Maynard as the, you know, Maynard was always, in the early, in those days, I mean, Maynard was viewed as the archdemon 
<laughs> so I handy look better, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, although if you probably had scratched beneath the surface, in many ways your father's views socially uh, were uh, probably more more progressive, if you could argue, that uh, Maynard was a you know he was a businessman. He wanted to make money. He wanted success. Um, so, I, but he did he did tie into one issue that really protected, and I think that that was the transportation and the neighborhood preservation issue. Um, and there he built a strong, almost uh, a vehement coalition. I think, you know, as you, uh, but then there were, I think, I think, you know, over time you began to see uh, a pragmatic white business community that saw real, you know, by your dad's time, and particularly with the Olympics, they began to see uh, this African American leadership as attracting extraordinary resources and visibility to the city. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, probably one of the earliest people to see that was Charlie. Mm -hmm. You know, Loudermilk of all people. You know, I mean, because they didn't get any more conservative than Charlie. Mm -hmm. But I, I would say two things too that you're, you know, I think your father benefited from the global and the, you know, and this sort of we're going to bring the economic growth to the community. But he also talked the language of the minister. I mean, I think he ministered to a lot of those folks, and you know, I think at some level there was a there was a relationship through his being a minister. I suspect that with Charlie Loudermilk, there was at some level, uh, mm -hmm. there was a kind of, that that may have have happened. But you also began to see emerging a, a very, a highly pragmatic political, a business class, white business class here that was just saying, look, uh, this is good for the city. And, and, and Billy Payne, I think, was the, you know, the kind of, archetype of that, Charlie Battle, the folks who got on early and rode it to the end, the Olympics. Mm -hmm. uh, I, my, my one contribution to that group mm -hmm. was I think I picked up the Buckhead group, people who were interested in arts and culture. I mean, it was just, you know, it, just because that had been my job, mm -hmm. I had built relationships with Everybody was on the board of the symphony. Everybody on the board of the high museum. It was a small. It was a relatively small but influential community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that when I ran for office, you know the, the you know David Goldwasser, who had chaired the symphony board, and whose family owned Print Pack or something. They owned uh, some co big co printing company here, or uh, you know the folks who were uh, on the board of the high museum. All those people would give parties for me and give me money. And you know? so mm -hmm. I think. I do think that there was a sense in which a community which had really never, or like a lot of Southern communities, people were in close proximity, mm -hmm. but the boundaries between relationships were so powerful that unless you were Vernon Jordan and your mother had worked for them, mm -hmm. and had you know you you knew them through a kind of 20th century version of the domestic. I mean, and you'd look at Vernon. I mean, Vernon will talk about it, you know the. Well, I was thinking of Carl Ware. Yeah, Carl Ware is another person. yeah, and and so th they were safe. But then you had these other folks who, gee whiz, you know, they came out of the black middle class. They didn't. Their parents didn't work for anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, and they were, and they had a sense of themselves. And they stood up to. They weren't diplomatic. And so it has taken a half century for those folks to build the kind of now, I think, pretty deep relationships. I mean, you look at what the, you know, the, the black Jewish relationship, which has now been sort of, uh, um, you know, formalized in that you know, they, what did they have? This is the 30th, 40th, 50th anniversary of that thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the relationships now are not just pragmatic. They're not just 
you know, we do this because you know, we have to build these alliances. A lot of this is deeply personal attachments that have now come over, you know, have, have been inherited by another generation or two. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I think that that's made this a different city. Not to say that race still isn't. I mean, I, I still think that, that race can be the flashpoint here. I, you know, I view all of this stuff, you know, and, and I, I was the big person to expand the county. All this stuff of the city of Milton and the city of, this is all racial. Mm-hmm. This is all racial. Right. And those people wouldn't have houses if I had zoned them, mm-hmm. you know. And what they didn't want was black people making decisions around their lives. Mm-hmm. And there's still some of that, but, you know, I, I feel like that stuff ultimately, you know, it's it's going to be dissipated by the diversity <laughs> of the nation. I mean, that's just yeah. that's well, it's just interesting because they build out for you know, and it's like they look up and say, "Well, but it's still not going to be a white." Because guess what? Like, because because we <laughs> can, we can afford to be there. Yeah. We like it. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a whole different that's thing. That's a whole different. But you know what? If Nini's got to be somewhere, I want her I to be in Alpharetta. I'd rather her be in Alpharetta <laughs> and not off of. Uh, not off a of damn forest. Yeah, not, <laughs> I don't, not, not my I don't, neighborhood. Not I don't need her on New Hope Road. Yeah, yeah. So, um, we'll talk some about the arts because I think that was one of the things. You know, why, why that was, how that became, you know, such a signature of that era. of that era. Mm-hmm. You know, it was ironic, and this is a story that I think a lot of people don't know. Uh, and I don't think anybody actually expected it to turn out that way. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't remember how this happened because I wasn't as much involved in the transition and the inaugural committee. Mm-hmm. But you got to ask somebody whose decision it was that the symphony orchestra would perform at Maynard's inauguration. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, when the symphony orchestra decision was made, and it might have been Robert Shaw. It could have, and I suspect it, it happened within the symphony. I don't think it happened at the then Memorial Arts Center. And then the decision, of course, that then uh, uh, Matta Wilda would perform. Mm-hmm. Uh, in some ways, I mean, that for me was the first sort of olive branch between the arts community and the African American uh, politi- emerging political community. And um, I also think it was a huge signal of the cultural sophistication of the African American community. Mm-hmm. But Even I know we have been singing that stuff over. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Over in the West End. Yeah, 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 yeah. but I mean, but that there was just a yeah. seamless. Yeah. And because, you know, Matta Wilda represented, I mean, I'm, I got to know Matta Wilda and all the sisters during the campaign because they were all down here. And you know she came all the way back from Sweden. If you made a movie about them, nobody would believe it. Yeah, yeah but it, it was fiction. Yeah, and and but, and, and delightful, mm-hmm. wonderful, mm-hmm. wonderful women. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, so she's performing. But the the real important thing that happened was slush, very quickly, soon after Maynard was in office, a delegation mm-hmm. from the arts community came to call on him. Mm-hmm. And I staffed the meeting. Mm-hmm. And in the room was Goodman Vigtel, who just passed away, the head of the High Museum. David Goldwasser, who was the chairman of the board of the symphony. A guy named Joe Perrin, who was the head of the art department at Georgia State. Uh, George Beatty may have come, because George was the head of the Georgia Council for the Arts. And 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 I Millie Jordan, Maynard's aunt. <laughs> yeah. And they said uh, it was it was it was a really I think it was a it was probably as important a meeting as any that happened in the mayor's office. So they said, look, um, all across this country, cities are getting involved in supporting their arts institutions. And um, we really think this is an opportunity for the arts community 
if you will champion it. I mean, that was basically the, the point of view. And <laughs> it's typical I mean, it said, sounds like a good idea. Michael, you do this. <laughs> so, so what we did was we created a mayor's ad hoc committee for the arts that met once a month up in City Hall and we put together a plan and it was chaired by Shirley. And we came up with a plan. We, you know, we, we, I mean, I, I went all the way up to Seattle, which had one of the most progressive cultural programs. And we decided that rather than creating an arts council, we would create, create an arts agency that would both fund work, but also create you know, programs that were support of the city. And the first thing that we did, we had something called the Mayor's Day for the Arts. A ragtag parade <laughs> headed up by uh, Bill Cosby and, uh, gosh, what's his name? Sidney Poitier, who were making a movie in town. Mm. Shirley. Oh, that's right, the movie where they run down the steps. Yeah, yeah. Big Bethel. Yeah, yeah. It was Let's Do It Again. Yeah, whatever it was. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, right. you know, I mean, but the Mayor's Day was, I mean, we had the ballet perform in the park. We had this, you know, suddenly the streets were closed off. But I think that was one of the first early indications that there was a real opportunity. And what you were doing is you were, you were suddenly connecting black and white. And, and it was a weird assortment of both. Mm -hmm. You know, because who were the black folks who knew anything about the arts and were real interested in it? Mm -hmm. O.T. Hammonds. That's mm -hmm. where we discovered O.T. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and then people who wanted us to <coughs> create a neighborhood art center, mm -hmm. you know, and that that brought out uh, everybody from uh, who was it? What's the woman's name? Oh, gosh, my brain's just my brain's not working. The uh, short story writer. Um, t -t 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 come to me in a minute. Black woman died of cancer. Was lived here. Uh, uh, come to me. So the the, the writers. You know, we created the Neighborhood Arts Center. And, you know, we employed, Sam worked there, Sam Jackson worked there, LaTanya worked there, his wife. John Riddle. John Riddle, my homeboy from Los Angeles, you know. Uh, uh, there had been an earlier Neighborhood Arts, uh, kind of Neighborhood Arts Center over in, in, off of Cascade. This was the first one that really had funding. Uh, Spike got started doing stuff over there. Mm -hmm. I remember bringing... Uh, Romare Bearden through there, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, but then you know you were doing things. You were creating opportunities for black artists, which had never really been, mm -hmm. not since you know Hale Woodruff had done the murals in the library. They'd you know not since they'd had the Atlanta University show. You bringing these artists, they were, and then you know you were, we were do, we were doing symphony performances in the park. Building audience for the Atlanta Symphony York. I, you know, I had a rough time dealing with Robert Shaw. He was a very difficult person to deal with. But I will say this: we gave him bigger audiences than he got from anybody else mm -hmm. with all those folks in the park. Uh, you started seeing, and 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 I'll just show you how. It didn't automatically start with this sort of kumbaya moment. I remember once Maynard went over to the the then Memorial Arts Center early in his. Uh, tour of duty as mayor and parked out in front and they towed his car. <laughs> <laughs> I told him, I said, you will never do that again. <laughs> they towed the mayor's car. Now, you know, they, most people would be happy to have a mayor show up. Mm -hmm. And this was 1974, 1970. They towed the mayor's car. And this was, but then through the mayor's ad, 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 so we decided to create a Bureau of Cultural Affairs. And, you know, we got a uh, hotel motel tax to cover them. And that was, you know, that was the beginning of it. But the, the other thing that I think it did was it, it kind of was one of those things that just had to happen over time for race relations to really change people who had a shared interest in something had to work together mm -hmm. to make it happen mm -hmm. and build the relationships that came mm -hmm. from that. 
you know, I think if you ask Shirley, who are some of the people who were with you in your first mayor's race, mm -hmm. she would go back to people she first met mm -hmm. doing that. Of course, she would also go back to people she first met mm -hmm. working on a Andy's campaign. Mm -hmm. But there were just, that was where you sort of opened. That's when Buckhead and Ansley and all those neighborhoods, you suddenly, you suddenly started finding mm -hmm. people who shared an interest and, mm -hmm. and friends, mm -hmm. people who became mm -hmm. your friends. And, and of course, the, now you look at it, and, and I think that African-American political leadership over nearly half, a, you know, through 40 years in support of culture has made this a cultural and now commercial entertainment capital. Mm -hmm. if, if you could put it, if you had to put it in racial terms, mm -hmm. you have what were then the white institutions, the museum, the Alliance Theater, the symphony, they have certainly grown in prominence since then. Museum, for sure. I mean, museum is now globally recognized doing all these things with the Louvre and stuff. But ba think back to 1973, 74. You said that, well, they'd been singing those songs over in the West End, but never anywhere else. Mm -hmm. The African-American the the guardian of African American arts and culture mm -hmm. was where I'm going from here. It was Spellman and the mm -hmm. it was you know Morehouse. It was mm -hmm. the the Glee Club. It was all that. And we were producing talent that had no place mm -hmm. to uh, showcase. Mm -hmm. Had no way of earning a living other than teaching. You think of all the important artists in this community, Janelsi and all these folks, they all had to be teachers. Mm -hmm. Now that's not nothing wrong with being a teacher, mm -hmm. but they, they, the, the musicians, the artists, the theater people, mm -hmm. the only place that they could earn a living. Mm -hmm. But because of what happened there, a generation of, of artists, I mean, Sam Jackson, I mean, Sam, I, Sam worked for me when I was director of cultural affairs. He was doing street theater, getting paid out of the Comprehensive Employment and Training Act. I know. I think that was one. Now, whose idea was that to use theater to to support the arts? It was the, it was ours. I mean, it just you know, we were looking we were looking for any money we could find, mm -hmm. and we hired artists. Uh, and we gave grants. I mean, that was that was what we did. That was sort of the. But think about it, and now today, the goodwill that that has produced, now you have an industry, mm -hmm. entertainment, a black, with a huge black visibility. This is a magnet. So, I mean, I, that's why when I say, you know, anybody, I mean, we went through, this was a painful birthing of a contemporary city, mm -hmm. and certainly the, the racial elements of pain associated with it were probably as great. But the commercial benefits, I mean, this is, so this has been, uh, I mean, economically, it's been to the, all to the good. And, um, and for me, you know, I, I do think that, you know, uh, I feel such a sense of, in some ways, accomplishment. I mean, I'm not, not all that connected to it anymore, but I mean, that you remember what it was like. And now, you know, I mean, Usher came and did the show the other day. Mm -hmm. We came. Usher came out to, uh, to, um, to, to Pasadena to tape our show for us. And you know, at one level, he's this global artist, but he's in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. You know, Tyler Perry. Mm -hmm. He's a, but he is an Atlanta. And and I I think. I think there's a self-consciousness now among some of these artists that, that you know, Kenny Leon. Mm -hmm. I mean, Kenny, probably more self-conscious than any of them, knows because Kenny was on that journey. I remember when his big breakthrough was to do the Gospel at Colonus at the Alliance Theater. Mm -hmm. And he needed extra money to do it. And, 
And you know, I was the chairman of the Fulton County Commission, and it was in the days when I could sort of you know put a hundred thousand dollars into something. And he got Morgan Freeman to to start it. This was before Morgan Freeman was a big deal. It was a huge success. I mean, these were the breakthrough activities, which suddenly began people began to see cross cultural stuff going on, but also that this that Atlanta became a, a go to place for artists and performers and stuff, they could make a living here. Mm -hmm. And they could then live here. Mm -hmm. And then they could become a part of the, uh, of the, uh, of the ecosystem and the cultural community. So, I mean, I, I, I think that, uh, uh, and so, so, you know, what is, if I were to step back and say, what ha you know, what are the things that have made the difference here? Uh, I would say I would say one would be I would I would say what are the sort of things that one would be that you, you still have to give an awful lot of prominence to the fact that there were Morehouse Spelman Clark Atlanta University mm -hmm. and ITC that you had an educational mm -hmm. factory mm -hmm. that was producing a middle class. And a, and a highly educated middle class that up to a point really the city couldn't absorb. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I remember in 68 or 69 when I, after we come, Pearl and I came back and we were young, I was 21, she was 20. We just got married, you know, she's finishing Spelman, I'm finishing my PhD. And up until 73 we were saying, you know, we actually literally I was going to go back, oh no, in 71, I was going to go back to graduate school. We literally, we went to Hanover, New Hampshire, because I had an opportunity to go to Dartmouth and finish my PhD. I could go back to Columbia. I had a job offer, uh, a, a, fellow, a teaching fellowship at Berkeley. And my sort of, you know, ace in the hole, none of this other stuff came through, was there was a program, a new program called the Institute for the Liberal Arts at, at Emory. And we were saying, you know, the, what were the pros and cons of Atlanta? Well, the, the con was, I mean, we liked it, we had friends here, we knew people, but the con was, you know, this is the irony, there were no young black people like us. <laughs> wow. Because they weren't, they, Andre, they weren't coming yeah. back. They would graduate yeah. and they would have to leave. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they're, they're, you, you know, Tommy Sampson, who was my, one of my classmates over at Morehouse, he could come back once he got his law degree because his uncle had a law firm here. Mm -hmm. But black folks weren't getting hired at the mm -hmm. law firms. Mm -hmm. They weren't getting hired at the architecture. They weren't getting hired at the CPAs. They had to, you know, they, there was just a limited number of choices. Mm -hmm. And that's what Maynard changed. That's what Maynard changed. And, and, the, and the thing that Maynard changed was the thing that he was vilified for, which was minority contracting. Mm -hmm. So he opened up the economic opportunity. He did what Italians did in New York and the Irish did in Boston. He, you know, made it legit for his own people to make a good living, put them into the establishment. So you had the education pipeline. Then of course that, then you started attracting the people from DC and you know, other places, so that this has become a mecca for African American talent. That has attracted people into this community. But I would say, and, and the other piece of it, obviously the other piece of it was, the whole civil rights and social justice element. So, you know, so the, 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 the black middle class meets the civil rights and social justice. Those were those things were here in some form or fashion already. The cultural stuff was here in some form or fashion. So there were elements of all that that, that once black folks got into political prominence then became this huge magnet for talent being attracted into the community. And, but, it, but you know, at the same time, white talent was coming back into this community as well. And I think you know what has really been the driver for a lot of this is 
these educational institutions, people come here to go to college so they can find it, they can get an early start on building a career in this community. And, you know, so my view is leadership and talent. <laughs> you know, there's a broad base of talent, but there was also a leadership class. There's certainly a leadership class in the African American community. There was a leadership tradition with the Ivan Allens in the business community that was progressive. But there was also this sort of, you, you talked about the New South. I always thought that the person who captured it best in a book that I detest was Margaret Mitchell in Gone with the Wind because the real powerful figures in that book are not the Ashley Wilkes's in the melody. It's the, it's the, it's the scrappy newcomers. Mm -hmm. It's the Rhett Butlers and the Scarlett O'Hara's, and this town is full of them. Mm. They're pretend, you know, I want to be careful how I say this. They are not the first families. Mm -hmm. They're the, you know, he, Rhett Butler was the, he was, he was the not so, he was the questionable Charlestonian who was running the Confederate blockade. Mm. That's how he made his money, and she was, you know, Better than no better than the shit. I mean, I thought that that in a sense she really did capture these very hungry, pragmatic, ambitious people, mm -hmm. and I think that's one thing that the city does have. I mean, it, I think it's a people come here because they're ambitious, and they want to succeed. And and what at the end of the day is the most important element for them is. Uh, is did they succeed? I mean, they're very pragmatic, and so that you know, they yeah. I maybe don't really know black people, and I may not really want to, but I think I better partner with them if I'm gonna get this job. Mm -hmm. And and you and I know how much of that happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these forced marriages, and after a while, guess what? Mm -hmm. They found that they weren't very different. Mm -hmm. They became mm -hmm. fast friends, and the next you know, I I think about. Um, you know, H.J. Russell and Company, and uh, oh gosh, what's the guy's name? One of the, some of the partners that he had, one of them, what was the guy's name? Who was Holder? Holder. Yeah, I don't, you know, probably didn't know one another up until a certain point, had to come together. Now, in the next generation, they do those partnerships like that, and they wouldn't go with anybody else, mm -hmm. you know? And it's been good for them. Mm -hmm. So, um, and and that and I think that you know when you go back and you say you think about all of the vilifying I keep using that term that Maynard got in the in the early 70s for the corrupt practices of mm -hmm. you know contracting and all you know, and forcing these these partnerships at the end of the day they've created a, a generation of businesses that are now <laughs> I mean, we we just uh, I'm on the board of the Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture, and yeah, you know, who's up there doing part of the work uh, in a joint venture? It's H.J. Russell. You know, I mean that that they've become major businesses able to compete anywhere. Mm -hmm. I, I'm through talking. I can't imagine. I'm We've had sorry. such a rich conversation <laughs> just listening to your. Uh, comments. In a way, you've addressed this, but I want to sort of highlight if you had to say a signal accomplishment of Andrew Young's tenure as mayor, mm -hmm. what would you highlight? In terms of issues that he addressed, Maynard you've discussed in terms of affirmative action, minority business development, and... Well, I mean, I, I, you know, I just think that, I mean, you obviously, you, you, you could just say, well, it was the, the Olympics. I think, I think Andy globalized it, America, Atlanta. I think that it was, I, I think that it was driving the notion that this is an international city. You know, I used to drive me crazy. Well, yeah, Atlanta's going to be the next great international city. Atlanta's going to be the next great international city. And it became, in a sense, you know, it, it, what in the heck are you talking about? What does that mean? You 
but we went from being a regional hub to being a global. You know, the the we went from you know steel in somebody's consul general, like we did, we ate all of New Orleans consul generals, to being a city where heads of state and nations came. Um, and I think, you know, I, I do think the, the, although, I mean, 96, he was not mayor any longer, but I think, I think getting the Olympics and the internationalization of the city, I would say, was his, because the internationalization was not just social and cultural, it was economic. You know, I remember uh, going on a, I only did one of the chamber tours with, with your dad. We went to, and I chose the best one, we went to Switzerland and Northern Italy. Mm. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You went for the food. Yeah, we went for the food. And I remember when we got to Milan, and one of the Agnellis met us for lunch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the Agnellis, I mean, they were the princes of Northern Italy, you know, and this, this, this guy was, I mean, he was one sharp brother, you know. Meeting with, you know, that, I, think, I remember when we went to a town in Switzerland, or somewhere, I can't remember where we were, but the mayor was the son of Rommel, the German um, general. We were, we were dealing, I mean, we, there was a kind of economic recognition, I mean, there was a recognition that we got globally that you just wouldn't get, we got because of your dad was an international figure. I remember, so when I worked for Maynard in 70, I was, I was director of cultural and quote international affairs. So I was the international person. And Maynard's first trip out of the country was to France. And we went to, to Paris and we went to Toulouse and we established Toulouse as a sister city. And for Maynard it was also a visit to the town where his parents had gotten married. And it was nice, you know. We got received at the Quai d'Orsay, the, the French Foreign Office. Maynard gave a speech in halting French. And we went to Toulouse. We were, we were entertained by the president of Coca-Cola Paris, whose name was Pernod, as in the liquor. But when you went when Andy was mayor, it was heads of state. It was political figures at the, you know, at the international level. And I, I think that, you know, it was both his, you know, at this point, at that point, deeply respected and recognized role in the civil rights movement, which this town, you know, this town, you know, just views civil rights people as, you know, you know, ordinaire, right. but, you're in my way, I'm trying to get yeah. bananas, or, or, or like, you know, Robert. the disrespect of Coretta is, you know, I put it at the top, at the top of the list on this one, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, oh, she's just pretentious, you know, she, uh, who, does she think she <laughs> who, who does she know she is, that's the problem, so, you know, but I think that, that that kind of, the civil rights thing gave, the civil rights roots at that point were now burnished and were being given the kind of global recognition. Mm -hmm. The role that he had played at the United Nations, mm -hmm. the relationships he had built with third world, third world leaders, particularly in Africa. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, you know, at that point, I mean, you're getting, you know, the, you know, the president of France is coming or something. You know, it was, you know, it was a different. Mm -hmm. So I think it was really the, for me. No, well, the, you know, the, at the top of the list is that's right. It's, you know, it's uh, Mandela coming here as part of his.
victory lap in the United States after getting out of uh, prison. Uh, but not, I mean, I mean and, and coming here because obviously of the connection to Dr. King, but also because this is a place where the African American leadership is. So I, I, my view is that, that I, I think rather than a specific policy, I think you have to say that it was the cementing of the international aspiration. Because the aspiration had been there for a while. I mean, I, you know, I think a lot of the, the whole, you know, when we got our first direct flights, those had happened earlier, but they were such hard-won battles, and they weren't creating a kind of, of critical mass that could suddenly say that this is more than just some place that's got a direct flight to Tokyo. Uh, I think today this is viewed as, you know, a a very important global city, and uh, I think that that you know I, I think that Andy gets that's on his list. One of the things we've been talking in, in the great uh, sort of large perspective on Atlanta and regional, metropolitan regional issues, but if I could pinpoint a specific development project in North Fulton, <laughs> could you say anything about Mr. Portman and his decision to build the office complex there adjacent to Perimeter Mall? Uh, did you fail? I, I tell you, I'm going to tell you what was the single most important North Fulton County development project. It wasn't John Portman. John Portman was, uh, was late to the party. Mm -hmm. It was the building of Country Club of the South. Mm -hmm. The first golf course <laughs> subdivision in North Fulton County. Mm -hmm. And Country Club of the South is built on property that Fulton County owned. We got, Jack Nicklaus reached out to Fulton County and said, I want that to build on. We swapped the property for something else that he had. He built Country Club of the South. Country Club of the South was the reason why UPS moved its corporate headquarters to Atlanta. Because what it did was it produced a form of suburban living that has attracted more corporate decision making. Why did John Portman build a building out there? Because that's where the executives now were. A lot, you know, not all of the executives, but there was a beginning to be a critical mass. And and you know, I think that was. If you want to ask me what was the worst environmental decision I made as a chairman. <laughs> The commission was to, build, to start building these golf courses, which you know are having, but having a you know they have an adverse impact on the 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 amount of water you use. But I think that it was the building of those golf course communities. How many of them do we have now in Fulton County? I mean, we've got a and it's you know one of the things that you learn over time is the most important influencer on a corporate relocation decision is where the executives want to live. And the executives wanted to live, black and white, at UPS, mm. wanted to live on a golf course. Mm. <laughs> and you go, and, and you know, you look at where all those folks now, I mean, it's, it, they live on those golf courses. So I, I actually think, my view, and that may be just because I was involved in the project and I didn't know Jack. I didn't know Jack Nicklaus from Adam's House. Kept people saying, "Well, you're going to get to walk the property with Jack Nicklaus." I said, "Okay, <laughs> who's Jack Nicklaus?" You know, <laughs> but uh, I think actually getting that first golf course community and making Fulton County and North Fulton County the kind of premier residential area for those high-end McMansions. Uh, help to until then it had been Dunwoody. Yes, it had been Buck, Buckhead and Dunwoody. You know, and 
And, and what people wound up getting was even more than that. They got the river. I mean, those are some of the most beautiful sites, you know, in Metro Atlanta. So I actually think it would. My dad preserved the river. Your dad preserved that the river. Chattahoochee. Um, no, that, yeah. Uh, what, what do you call it? The Parkland. Right. Yeah. And he did that as a member of Congress. Yes, and and the, the so the I would say that we made up for it. <laughs> <laughs> by helping to preserve it in South Fulton County because there's you know there's a lot of there's a, now a lot of uh, preserved mm -hmm. river riverfront and uh, well that's where I'm waiting to move where where the um, riverfront that used to be bank headquarters <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when the belt line gets finished belt. <laughs> yeah yeah you just follow that belt line that's where to buy now mm -hmm. but I mean so I I actually I actually think that. That from the, the the one North Fulton thing, the even, you know. So I would say, you know, as I look at the things that I thought had the most wound up, wound up having the most impact, it was when we zoned the Mobile Land Development Corporation way north of the river, and that was I remember when they had the groundbreaking for that. I couldn't even find it. It was so far Mobile Land Development Corporation. It's mm -hmm. way way north of the river. Mm -hmm. That was important because then you, that's when you start getting these campuses to be built. Then we did the residential, and then we did Georgia 400. I think those are the things that really, really uh, change. And you know, at the end of the day, getting that MARTA line up 400, then you know, is made that a robust uh, employment center that people that ordinary people could have access to. I just knew that most of his building, of course, is concentrated mm -hmm. in downtown. Yeah. But I just wondered No, why because he ended up. you know, the thing was that that well, the other part of things that people don't know about about John. J there was another company that John had which was called Portman Berry. And the and the person I would deal with most times was Hal Barry. Hal was the one who was doing his suburban development, mm -hmm. and just and you know so that that what I mean you know Portman is a you know is a down, known for the downtown work and he's done that in cities around the country New York Detroit and elsewhere, but he's also got this suburban, and his other partners I mean he was in partnership. These people, you know, with Frank Carter and Trammell Crow, mm -hmm. all those people, and and so he, I think he also had an industrial. So so the Fulton, the step on Fulton Industrial. Uh, that that I think he had something to that that he and his company had something to do with. It wasn't the it wasn't the stuff that was, mm -hmm. and then he was doing the international stuff in Hong Kong and other places with some of these same, some of these same partners. So. No. He even did the plan for Savannah State College. Have you ever seen the Savannah State campus? I mean, it's gorgeous. Portman's company designed, did the plan I, I need to go ahead with that, no. Uh, yeah. We saw the pictures and the renderings up there in his mm -hmm. office. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, I was on, and I was like, wow, this is a well-kept secret. Who knew this little black yeah. college was so, which was such a beautiful place to go to school? Yeah. You know, and then they have the only Marine something. There's some specialized program they have that, you know, And it's probably a very mid-century looking campus then. A lot of it, yeah. yeah. The one we have to preserve is ITC, which was designed by Robinson mm. and is a mid-century. Mm. It's the only black mid-century mm. campus done, designed by a black architect. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so. Who knows? A lot of work. Somebody will come along and say, we don't like modern. Yeah, well, the mid-century is hip. Everybody likes it now. Uh, yeah. I yeah. like it. I do. I mean, you know, I, I, I grew up, well, growing up in Los Angeles, I mean, there's a lot of mid-century, yeah. uh, but it, it, it wears well. Yeah. All right, you all. Okay. We threw it. You have been generous with your time. Yeah, I know I have. I, I, I want recognition in the book. Absolutely. We thank you. So are you, ri are you, gonna, are you writing something? Yeah, Is we're going to write. In fact, we don't know how many books we may end up writing yeah. based on this material because it's just so rich, yeah. you know, and, but, but, the sort of impetus from it is to say nobody knows why Atlanta is this way, mm -hmm. right? 
And, you know, you're definitely one of the people who has not gotten the recognition mm -hmm. for the hard career, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, really, you put your political career on the line for what was best for the for the region. Yeah, but I'm going to write my own book. And you need to. And yeah, you need I will. To. I will. And you need to. But, you know, I will, say, I, I will say this. I'm so delighted to hear this orientation because, you know, when I, I went and almost 20 years ago. I went over to Emory and I said, look, I got my papers. I don't know what to do with them. Mm -hmm. I, I said, you know, and I'm a rare book collector. Mm -hmm. So I said, mm. so I said, let's talk so about Randall, it. So Randall, when Randall No, 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 no. That was before Randall. Oh, okay. And it was as a result of that conversation yeah. that we hired Randall. Mm. But, and, and of course, Randall has gone off in this wonderful direction of collecting and, and Rudolph, and Rudolph and I had some, mm -hmm. I think, a sort of an alienation because of this. I said, you know, I think all this stuff that you're doing to collect the arts and le literature. Mm -hmm. But I said, and that's right. I mean, and they've done a great job. and they, mm -hmm. But the unique Atlanta story is civil rights mm -hmm. and the emergence of a political class that has redefined the city. Mm -hmm. And you know that may, and that is not. Uh, and I love her. You know that's not Toni Morrison. That's mm -hmm. not you know that's that's not a, that is a po social justice and political movement, and it has to be documented. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I still think that this community. Maynard didn't write his own book. Mm -hmm. right. Right. You know, and uh, I think I I think. We have to tell our own stories, mm -hmm. and you know it's just like uh, I went to see Lincoln. I haven't seen Django yet. I'm gonna go see it. But yeah, I'm so pissed off at that movie. Mm -hmm. You go into that movie, and yeah, I mean it's hard. I mean I love Lincoln. It's a great guy. All that. Mm -hmm. But there, the all the black people down there waiting for Massa to mm -hmm. to, to liberate them. Right. It it's not the true history of the 19th century. Right. Frederick Douglass does not appear right, in that. Which is unbelievable. Now, now, Mrs. Keckley was a real character, she, mm -hmm. but she was not a slave and she didn't live at the White House. She had her own home and her own business. Mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of her clients was, uh, there was a wonderful story in the New York Times yesterday about her, because there's a new book coming out about her. And she wrote her own book. Mm -hmm. And after she wrote her book three years after Lincoln died, Mrs. Lincoln wouldn't speak to her again because she published a lot of letters there. But, uh, you know, she, she started to... Uh, aid society for the for the the freed slaves. I mean, she was she was a very, but you know, how can you how can you even in this last ninety days of this guy's life, mm -hmm. black folks were pushing for the Emancipation Proclamation, right. and that gratuitous scene at the end, where Thaddeus Stevens comes home and gets in bed with a black woman. I said, you know. That's a whole different. I mean, but she's a, she's another true character. Well, she is a true character. She is a true character. She worked for him for twenty five years. What the relationship was, we, don't, right. we do not know. Right. And the gratuitousness of I did all that so I could bring this home and to right. the, with the with right. the black woman I got in bed. Right. I was like, you know, let's not open that can of worms again. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. but you know, I thought I was. So, which says to me, and I mean, you know, but he's made his movie, mm -hmm. and he's told his story his way. His way, right. So, just shame on us. Right. And so that's what we're trying to do. This will be, and I talked to Taya Ryan. She's really excited. I mean, we want to do this as a documentary piece. Do it as a at least one book, probably mm -hmm. maybe several. Um, you know who you should talk to about the documentary part of it mm -hmm. is uh, Nelson. Uh, what's his name? What's his first name? He's the African American filmmaker, Stanley Nelson. He has won the Genius Award. He's getting ready to do a series on black colleges. Mm. He's Phil Ransom. You know Phil? Um, well, Phil Benita Ransom. Do you remember her? Mm -hmm. Remember Benita? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Benita's husband. He's a lawyer. Harvard. Mm -hmm. he, his his grandfather mm -hmm. was Madam C. J. Walker's lawyer. Mm. Harvard. His father went to Harvard. He went to Harvard Law mm -hmm. School. But he lives right over there in the Cascades. Mm -hmm. But Stanley, and if you reach out to me, Stanley, I, I would certainly think about Stanley as one of the people you would look at mm -hmm. because now that St. Clair is gone, I mean, mm -hmm. born, I mean, he's, he is the dean of black 
uh, um, he, and he did, he, he's the dean of black documentarians, he did a film call, uh, called Soldiers Without Swords mm -hmm. about the black press. Mm -hmm. um, but I would, and he's, he's, a, he's I, I'd love to have to connect the two of you. But I mean, you, this is a, it, well, I feel like the first thing we're doing, because uh, we put all of, all of my stuff is there, mm -hmm. and I mean, all of, we put all of my mother's papers there, mm -hmm. we're getting our newspaper, all of, mm -hmm. we have five unpublished full-length novel manuscripts of hers mm -hmm. that we're reading and stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when, you know, I just think there's a, you know, there's a, there is a... So now the thing, you know, you can do is you can e-publish it. You, you know, you can self-publish it. You don't have to do the whole. And, or sometimes the university. Yeah, well, we're, well, we're, we're, we're going through, we're going through the material now and trying to make the decisions and then what becomes, I mean, but the point is, just what you're doing here. I mean, at, at the end of the day, I think you want the people who were most closely associated with this to begin to tell the story. Mm -hmm. But the most, Im even more important than that is to have the stuff there so other di other historians over time mm -hmm. and in the future. And that's can. the thing with the archive, with the, with the all these interviews, because people can draw different conclusions. Yes. They may they may want to delve down on one mm -hmm. aspect, especially you know graduate students. So it it allows for people to come to to continue to have this, and we've got about sixty, um, you know, interviews. We had like a five-hour interview with Henrietta Anthony about you know this yeah. whole. Yeah, I mean these are with Atlanta well, Lakers. and and you want you, you you want to talk about the unsung voice heroes and heroines, but just the voices that need to be captured, because I mean look at this. Nobody interviewed Dora. Well, Dora has a book. Oh, she did Actually, have a book. You know what? I can give you. Let me give you Dora's book. I need to. We need to.